Hi, we're looking at, credit, at um, more on politics. Today and for the next several weeks, I'm going to take a look at a specific political issue that I know something about and kind of model for you what I meant by the last three weeks, where I talked about not being guilted, I talked about not doing a pendulum swing, and I talked about sifting the issues. So we're going to look at critical race theory. And I, I have several weeks on this. Today, we're going to focus on the issue of oppression. All right. So... Um, for uh, you may think you may have noticed that race has become a big issue in the last few years. About 20 years ago, it wasn't a big issue in the mainstream of the consciousness of, of America, at least not white America. It was um, not something uh, people like me just looked at and thought, well, it's been solved, right? The civil rights movement took care of things. There's not, not really much racism around anymore. Um, but um, during Obama's tenure and then later on during Trump's tenure, increasingly race has become a fraught issue in the United States. People have really gotten concerned about it. With the Black Lives Matter movement, they became even more concerned. And with a lot of different things that happened uh, with different um, people, that it became a really center stage. So the, there's a lot of people these days who disagree on whether racism is an issue and how big an issue it is. Uh, they disagree even a little bit on what should racism be defined as and what should we do about it? So it's become a big question. And in the last few years, one of the things people have noticed is, is that's a worldview difference. In other words, it's not just a matter of what the facts are. Did certain people in fact get mistreated by the police? Did Are there certain laws or certain customs that in fact make it harder for blacks than for whites? People definitely disagree on some of that. But they also disagree on how to interpret all this stuff. What should count as evidence of racism? What kinds of things should we do about racism? What should our response be to it? All sorts of other things that depend not just on the facts, but on the worldview you have, on the way you think about things. And one of the things that's become more and more evident is that um, most conservatives and most liberals differ very greatly on this worldview. There's ways that they think about race that are quite different from one to the other. And... Um, the right, in, a, in addressing this, has identified a name for that for the left's worldview. They call it critical race theory, or uh, CRT. And critical race theory has come under attack from some uh, Christian uh, writers and readers and thinkers, and it's been defended by others. And in general, the Christian world has had to try to understand what critical race theory is and how they should respond to it. So here, for example, is... Uh, an ex uh, something that kind of was put out by the Southern Baptist Convention. This is their paper on critical race theory and intersectionality. And they say critical race theory is a set of analytical tools that um, explain how, um, how race uh, ha works and what we need to do about it. And they say sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Here's a book by uh, Vadi Bakum who says, uh, uh, who says, no, 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 critical race theory is completely dangerous, completely wrong, and we need to stand against it at every every instance. So you can decide some of this for yourself. I'm going to talk about how I think we should think about critical race theory in this uh, in this teaching. But it's not so critical to me that you under, that you agree with me as that you see the kind of process I'm using to try to work things out and that you kind of sort of understand how to use that process for yourself, even if you come to different conclusions than I do. So uh, critical race theory is a big deal. A lot of Christians disagree on how important it is, how true it is, how false it is. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, let's see. Um, so what is critical race theory? Uh, it has Marxist roots, and that's one of the reasons a lot of Christians very con get very concerned about it. It started with Marxism, uh, which is different than communist Russia. It's it's a, a philosopher, Marx, who was back in the 1800s, and he had a certain set of philosophies that became really influential that led to the general area known as critical theory in recent philosophy. And the critical theory breaks into different sections. There's a critical race theory and a critical feminist theory, and basically a critical theory for almost every group of oppressed people. There's a different critical theory. And uh, it, that's just a, that's sort of what critical race theory became. And then all that gets distilled down into kind of the pop culture version. So you always get, you get in the mainstream media something which is just sort of a dumbed down version of this. If you read what's really being said, it's sometimes a little different than what the mainstream media tells you. But in many ways, the, the ideas of critical theory, the ideas of critical race theory have become embedded in the mainstream media, although not in the super conservative media. There's uh, some differences there. And that's what I think most people mean by critical race theory. Now, um, 
one of the things that people are saying is that it's being taught in schools and we just need to stop it. And the, the, um, the liberals tend to say, what do you mean it's not being taught in schools? And the conservatives tend to say, of course, it's being taught in schools. Is it being taught in schools? Well, yes and no. Um, it's not being explicitly taught as a theory. It's much too complicated. Nobody's telling second graders, here's their critical race theory and here's how you should think about it. But you need to remember it's not just a theory. It's a worldview. It's a way of thinking about things. And so that shapes how people teach everything else. If I kind of agree with critical race theory, then the way I teach almost everything else in my classroom will be affected by my critical race theory views. Just like if you're a Christian, that will create a worldview which will affect how you teach almost everything else you teach. Um, and a worldview is more caught than taught. It's not that I will be telling students, you have to agree with these things. It's more that I'll just build those into everything else I teach. So I'm not a fan of trying to ban CRT from schools. I don't think you're going to be able to do it because it's a worldview rather than a set of specific things that are being claimed. I think you'll get, I think you can easily ban it from schools and it still won't stop it from being sort of caught from the teachers. So um, I, I just think we need to recognize as a worldview that we need to be able to engage with and decide what we think about and, and show where it's wrong and where it's right. Okay. So let's talk about CRT and let's start with the Marxist roots of it. It does come primarily originally from critical theory, which comes from Marxism. There's two important things I want to emphasize. I oversimplifying like crazy here to make it understandable in just one teaching. First of all, Marxism is very critical of capitalism. So you get all the economic questions of capitalism versus socialism versus communism, whether it works and all sorts of things like that. That's certainly relevant to politics, but it's not that relevant to critical race theory. So I'm going to mainly uh, ignore that. I mean, it raises questions on whether <coughs> some people say that that Marxism teaches envy, but other people could easily say that capitalism teaches greed. They both seem to be based on sins. <laughs> But that's not, that's the question that we can debate some other time if we talk about economics and politics and how it fits with the Bible. Um, for now, I want to pick up on the other piece of Marxism. Marxism is very, very much based on oppression, on the, uh, the idea that there's oppression. Hold on just a minute. On oppression. And that's kind of the point of critical theory. Critical theory says, let's not worry about the economics only. Let's worry about other kinds of power, other kinds of ways in which um, there's a, a struggle between different classes. And so they focus on oppression as a whole. Um, specifically, there's a focus on oppression, but there's also a suspicion of people who are in power. Marx thought that our that oppression with it, he was thinking in terms of capitalism, he thought that the class oppression by the rich of the poor was so pervasive that it affected absolutely everything in our lives. He thought that our language was affected by capitalism and our thinking was affected by capitalism. Our culture was affected by capitalism. And so that we weren't able to be, uh, we, we were so deceived by our culture that we weren't even able to see the oppression when it was happening. We were blinded by the system. And by the system, he didn't just mean institutions. He meant by a culture, by our language, by the assumptions we made, by our worldview and everything and much beyond that. Uh, for example, that's how he saw Christianity as part of that system. He asked, how does Christianity function in keeping the rich in charge? And his answer was, you probably heard this quote, that religion is the opiate of the people. What he meant is Christianity is nothing more than a system that's developed for keeping the poor from making, uh, from thinking that they shouldn't be oppressed. It, it's only simply developed as a way to keep the poor pacified. They'll wait for heaven instead of trying to make changes now. My point isn't that he's anti-Christianity, he is. My point is that he, he thinks everything is sort of folded into this cultural system that keeps us from seeing the oppression we're around. And that that's true everywhere. He thinks that the people in power are themselves unaware of this, that they are deceived into thinking they have a right to be in charge when in fact they don't. So he expects that the oppression will be mostly invisible to us because the way we think, the way we speak, Everything we're educated in, everything we're taught is all blinding us to it. So that is picked up by people in critical theory, even when they're no longer talking about economics. When they're talking about race, they're thinking the same things. They're thinking there's oppression everywhere, but we're blinded to it. We don't see it because the whole system, that is our culture and our language and our assumptions and our, 
our media and, and everything sort of keeps us from seeing it. And those who are in power are themselves unaware of that. Whites don't realize how much they dominate blacks because they're kept from even seeing it by all the things in their lives. So that's an important idea, this focus on oppression and suspicion of those in power. Um, so how does this play out when you actually think about race? Well, think about it. I'm not going to get into it, but think about white privilege. Think about white fragility, if you've heard of that, cultural appropriation, what micro microaggressions, the defund the police movement, et cetera. Every one of those, you'll see a focus on oppression and a suspicion of those in power and the assumption that those in power won't even see that they are doing things which are oppressive. So that's kind of some of the, the heartbeat of critical race theory. One of the most important things that I will talk about is how this affects our definition of racism, because there are two different definitions being used, usually by the left and by the right, basically by those who agree with critical race theory and those who don't. And it, it means that people often talk past each other when they're asking questions about race. The definition that I grew up with, which is not the critical race theory definition, is that race, racism means racial discrimination. It means racism occurs when someone discriminates on the basis of race without a legitimate reason to do so. What I mean is if I'm hiring somebody to play a black man in a movie, then it's, uh, it's legitimate for me to ask, should he be black? But if I'm hiring somebody to be an accountant, it's not legitimate for me to discriminate on the basis of race. So for the most part, race, racism, being racism free means being colorblind. It means not noticing race not thinking about race. And when I, in 2005, looked around and said racism has largely been eliminated, what I meant was, I don't think about race very much, and neither do most of the people I know. Look, we're not racially discriminating anymore. But definition two is what critical race theory uses. They don't mean racial discrimination. They mean racial oppression, when one group oppresses another based on their race. Racism occurs when someone is oppressed based on the basis of race. And you might say, well, what difference does this make? Aren't they the same thing? Well, not always. For example, um, suppose you have a quota for your business that you're going to make sure you hire a certain percentage of black people so that you, you look at somebody's race to make sure that they'll be hired to reverse the, the inequities within the workplace. The first person will say, that's an example of racism. It may be good racism somehow, but it's racial discrimination. It's discrimination on the basis of race for hiring somebody. But the second person will say, that's not oppression. It's not oppressing people to give them a job. That's not oppression at all. And if you say, well, it, it keeps the white person from getting a job, they'll say, that's not oppression, though, because whites already have the power. It's not oppression unless it's against somebody who's in a weaker position, against somebody who doesn't have the power. Same kind of thing happens in other ways. Somebody says, how come black comedians are allowed to make fun of white, com white people, but white comedians are not allowed to make fun of black people? For them, they say, well, that's racial discrimination. But the CRT crowd will say, that's not oppression. You're not oppressing people if the power group not in power makes fun of the people in power. That's very different than the people in power making fun of the people who are not in power. It's only wrong if you're punching down. It's only wrong if you're punching, if you're hitting people who are already weaker than you are. The same thing happens with a critical feminist theory. People say, why is it, is it race? Why is it um, uh, discriminatory? Why is it wrong for men to make fun of women, but okay for women to make fun of men? And the answer is because it's not oppression in one direction. It's only oppressive if it goes in the other direction. So two people will have a debate and one person will say, how can you not see that this is racist? And the other one will say, how can you not see that it's not racist? And sometimes neither one realizes that the other group is working with a different definition of racism. And I sort of wish I could step in sometimes and say, time out, time out. You're talking about different things. You might actually agree <coughs> about what you're saying if you could agree on a definition. But but that's one of the places where this makes a difference. It all depends on whether oppression is the core of your understanding or not. I think it's fine to talk about both. I, I don't mind either definition. I just think we need to be clear about what we're talking about or it will get very confusing and people end up arguing over things that aren't even an issue. All right, so I said one of the things we're supposed to do is look for any excellence or anything worthy of praise. What is excellent in critical race theory in terms of oppression? That's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. Um, is oppression actually a concern in Scripture? Is it a major concern in the Bible, or is it just a minor thing? 
I used to think oppression was not really a concern in scripture, but I've changed my mind. I think the answer is yes. Oppression is talked about a lot in scripture, not always by that name, but it's there a lot. And three things have changed my mind. I'm not going to go into detail on any of these things. If you have questions, I urge you to search it out for yourself and see if you agree. It would take several more weeks to really dig into these, but I'm going to point you to where you should look. First of all, I thought it was not a major concern because I saw how much scripture focused on submission to authority. And uh, I thought that's the concern in scripture is rebellion. The target of scripture is rebelling against authority. And it wasn't until much later in my life that I started noticing that scripture doesn't just talk about rebelling against authority. It also talks of abuse of, about abuse of authority. It seems sort of equally divided between warning people to submit to authority and warning people not to abuse authority. As a quick example, I used to look at the fall and say the example of the fall is that the original sin, the main sin, was rejecting the authority of God. He said, don't eat of the tree, we ate of it. And then one day I realized that you can can reframe that same sin as abusing authority because they ate the fruit because they wanted to become like God's. They wanted to have God's power. It was a power grab. So you can think of it as that they were rejecting God's authority, or you can think of it as that they were grabbing their own authority. They were wanting to control everything and everybody else. And either one is an accurate description of what the fall was. And either one is an accurate description of what almost every sin is for us. We're almost always in every sin we commit, both rejecting God's authority, not submitting to him, and grabbing authority for ourselves, abusing the authority we think we can get away with. And both of those things are true. And the more you start looking at it, the more you realize that there's a lot of scripture focusing on how people took authority and abused it. The second thing is I started realizing the Old Testament prophets focus strongly in oppression and social justice. Uh, Social justice sort of for a while became a a bad word in Christian circles. It was like, don't talk about social justice. We're supposed to preach the gospel. And I was sort of with that until I started noticing how often the Old Testament prophets, when they when they criticize what's going wrong in society, about a third or a half of the time they're criticizing injustice to the to the poor and the weak. That's what they keep talking about. And I realized how big a deal was in the Old Testament. And then also both the Old Testament and the Gospels focus on a hope for social justice and an end to oppression when Jesus returns. So many scriptures talk about the fact that we are looking for the Messiah to return so that he can finally end oppression. And I keep seeing this the more I read the Old Testament and the more I read the Gospels, that that Jesus is saying, the Old Testament prophets were saying, when the kingdom comes, there'll be an end to oppression. And the, and the people who are oppressed can rejoice. And that's why Jesus comes and says, I'm preaching hope for the uh, for the poor and the blind and the and the and the sick and the and so on, he's saying, and the captives, those who've been under oppressive authority, will finally be set free. And I had never noticed how strongly this theme runs through the whole Old Testament and through the Gospels as well. Um, so I think oppression is a major concern in the Bible, which means, how should we think about the question of social justice? And is that in opposition to the gospel? These have been opposed to each other by a lot of Christians. They say, we don't believe in social justice. We believe in the gospel. But they're not against each other. They're not the same thing, but they're not against each other. So first of all, part of the gospel is the return of Jesus to establish social justice within the kingdom of God. Part of what we're preaching is not just that you're going to go to heaven when you die, but that there will be a kingdom of God on earth, that Jesus is coming back. And uh, when he comes back, he's going to make things right. He's going to stop things in the world that are wrong. So there will be an end to systemic racism of any kind, to racism of every kind, when Jesus is here on the throne. And that's part of the gospel, again, if you follow what Scripture says. Secondly, we preach the need to repent now before that kingdom comes. Once people recognize, yes, we're looking for Jesus to come and establish justice, now comes the question, but how will you fare? Will you be found just? Or will you be judged? And now we can say, so you need to repent and get forgiven now so that you'll be right with with Jesus when he comes back. So we preach that salvation and forgiveness is available now before Jesus returns. This is the biblical pattern for doing this in many ways. I shouldn't say the biblical pattern. It's a biblical pattern for doing this. Um, And then as we live the gospel out around us, we don't actually establish the kingdom of God on earth. We wait for Jesus. That's coming later. There's a verse that says, you turn to God from idols to serve a living true God and to wait for his son from heaven. 
who be raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Jesus is the one who's going to rescue us from the judgment that's coming. And in the meantime, we wait for him. Another verse says, put your faith in, uh, put your hope entirely on the grace that's to be brought to you on the return of Jesus Christ. So we're not setting up a perfect system of justice. Social justice doesn't mean we're going to get that perfect just society in this world because this world is still full of sin and it's not, it's not ever going to happen. But we wait for Jesus. And in the meantime, we model the kingdom for the world as a sign that it's coming. Jesus went everywhere doing a healing and delivering from demons and teaching things and, and modeling for the world these things as signs that the kingdom was on its way. And we do the same thing now. We do what we can to help those around us. We do what we can to bring social justice where we can. We do what we can to preach it and teach it, not because we're going to establish our own government, which will be perfect, but because we're waiting for Jesus to come and we're pointing out to people what is coming and what it will be like. We live, for example, with racism. We hope we're supposed to live in a way that's so free from racial oppression and racial discrimination, that when people look at us, they say, wow, that makes me think that there might be something better coming. And then we have an end for the gospel. Okay, so what is excellent in CRT? The desire for social justice. That's an excellent thing. It's a biblical thing, even though I didn't know it at one point. And an end to oppression. That is something we should be desiring. Is something we should be looking for. All right, so that's what's excellent in CRT. What's wrong in CRT? Remember, we're, we're supposed to abstain from every form of evil, from everything evil, whether it looks good or evil. Just abstain from it if it's evil. So here's the th three things that I would point out. There is a tendency in critical race theory to think that to embrace revolution instead of submission, to say we've got to set this up ourselves. We've got to, there, there's sometimes even an embracing of, of an endorsing of violence if that's necessary. We have to fix the problem. Um, there's a tendency to see only the sin of racism, as though that's all that matters. But there's lots of sins that people commit, not just racism and not just oppression. There's a lot of things that are, are sins, and we are seeing the destructiveness of all of them. And there's a tendency to reject Christianity as a whole because some of it has been oppressive. There's a tendency within critical race theory to say, since the church has at times been racist, and it has been, since the church is sometimes patriarchal in a negative way, and it is sometimes, therefore, we reject that. Uh, and since the Bible's been used to support racism, we reject the Bible. Well, that's a very bad idea because the Bible is actually pointing to the only real solution to these things that's coming. So the tendency to embrace revolution instead of submission, um, Marx would be upset with me. He would say, see, you're letting religion be the opening of the people again. But that's just the fact that we are not the ones to establish the brand new society. If we did, we would find there was still oppression in it. We would just have switched who was in charge. And it, it's not just the sin of racism, it's other things as well. In general, critical race theory goes most wrong when it becomes an idol. When people begin to say the only thing that matters is what we're seeing. The only sin that matters is racism. The only good that matters is ending oppression against people on the basis of race. Whenever it becomes the only thing there is, that's when it goes the farthest wrong. So um, these are some of the things to watch out for as well. Now, next week, I'm going to talk about systemic racism and critical race theory and what is excellent in that concept and what's wrong with that concept. And we'll talk more about this then. Thanks. Goodbye.